We good to go, Megan? Yes, you can go ahead. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hereby call the order of the City of Ithaca Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for February 1st, 2022. The board operates under the provisions of the Ithaca City Charter, Ithaca Zoning Ordinance, Ithaca Sign Ordinance, and the board's own rules of procedures. Board compromises or er, comprises five members nominated by the mayor and approved by common council. Board members present tonight are Michael Cannon, Joseph Kirby, and Stephen Henderson, as well as Assistant City Attorney Victor Kessler and Zoning Administrator Megan Wilson, staff to the board. I'm David Barkin, Chairperson of the board. The Secretary to the board, Megan Wilson, will call each, each case in the order listed on the agenda. Appellants will then have a maximum of five minutes to present their new material or highlight aspects of their appeal. Board members may question appellants on any areas requiring clarification. Full consideration of appeals requires a public hearing, deliberation, and then voting by the board. These actions occur only after the appellant has filed appropriate documents with the Zoning Division and Planning and Development Board. Public hearings include testimony from, quote, interested parties. Uh, the board considers interested parties persons who live, work, or own property within 750 feet of the property, who are authorized representatives of recognized adjacent neighborhood civic groups, or who are elected city officials. Board members may question testifying interested parties in any areas requiring clarification. Persons who do not meet the board's interested party definition will not be heard. Comments are limited to three minutes. Appellants will then be allowed to rebut opposing testimony, but appellants' comments must be limited to strict rebuttal of the issues raised by those opposed and will be limited to five minutes. A timer will sound at the, uh, at the end of each speaker's allotted time. While we do not adhere to strict rules of evidence, we do consider this a quasi-judicial proceeding and we base our decisions on the official record. The official record consists of application materials filed with the zoning division, correspondence relating to cases received by the zoning division and planning and development boards, own findings and recommendations, if any, in the record of tonight's meeting. An audio recording is being made of this meeting. Therefore, it is essential anyone wanting to be heard speaks clearly, so their comments are recorded and heard by everyone. Extraneous comments will neither be recorded nor considered by the board. We ask everyone to limit their comments to the zoning issues of each appeal and not comment on matters beyond the board's jurisdiction. Following the appellant's rebuttal, the appeal hearing will be closed and the board will begin deliberation. The board is required to render a decision within 62 days of the public uh, public hearings closure. Once the hearing is closed, no further testimony will be taken. It takes three votes to approve a motion to grant a variance or favorable interpretation. In the event of a tie vote, an appeal is denied. Tonight's online meeting format requires us to manage public comment differently, but the board will still welcomes input from interested parties. Tonight's appeals are available for public review on the city website and the meeting is being streamed live online via YouTube. Interested parties are welcome to address the board as part of this online meeting or may submit written comments to be read into the record during the public hearing. Uh, Megan, would you kindly call our first case or in tonight's case, um, elaborate as to where we're starting off? Sure. So our first appeal is appeal number 3202 for 815 South Aurora Street. Appeal of Suzanne Dennis and South Hill Living Solutions, LLC of the Zoning Administrator's Determination that the construction of three multiple dwellings at 815 South Aurora Street meet the requirement of 325-8, column 1415 rear yard, 325-20F3B landscape compliance method for newer and large parking area with a capacity of three or more parking spaces and lots within residential zoning districts, 325-299 fall zone and setback requirements for tier three personal personal wireless service facilities. Um, and at this, and there was two, sorry, um, two other sections are 325-20-D2-E access requirements and 325-20-E3 front yard parking. Um, the board has heard presentations of this appeal and held a public hearing um, at beginning at the December 2021 meeting um, and continuing at the January 4th, 2022 meeting. So the board is, the public hearing has been closed and the board is going to resume this evening with deliberation of this appeal. Thank you, Megan. Um, and with that, we'll also be voting um, on each of these cases tonight. There's a five total regarding this appeal, unless I'm missing anything. And I'd like to, you know, we'll start off just going one by one. Um, we'll deliberate, we'll discuss, and then 
Megan, do you want us to vote on everything at the very end or we'll vote on each and then go on to the next one? Um, I think if the board is comfortable, you can kind of go through one by one and, and vote once you're concluded your deliberation on each section since we will go through all, all five this evening. Okay, thanks. Uh, starting off with that related to the case uh, access requirements, right? So this is where the appellants assert that the driveway grade exceeds the 8% allowed by the zoning ordinance. Does anybody have uh, anything they'd like to start with regarding this appeal? Yeah, I, I can weigh in on this one. Um, I feel like Gino's method was sound. Um, the ordinance mentions no um, mention of, of um, where you're measuring from and to within that um, amount of distance. And um, I've got to gotta believe that uh, he came to a, a correct decision with the method that he used. And there was no evidence that the method he used was an incorrect method. Okay. Uh, Steven or Joe, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would uh, agree that Gino's uh, decision was sound based on the, the verbiage of the code. Um, it, there's no language in there saying that any point within the first 25 feet can't exceed eight. It just says that the first 25 feet can't exceed 8% and it doesn't overall. So that's where I'm at on that one. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. Um, it doesn't specify that no part of it. And I think the parts that were highlighted um, aren't, they don't constitute entire locations of the driveway where like one portion, you know, a 10 foot portion where a theoretical truck going up it would have issues um, are necessarily affected. We were looking at the grades as they went around the corner, if I'm recalling correctly. And so I don't think, um, yeah, the verbiage really dealt with that. And so without that, yeah, I think it was applied correctly um, and no variance was needed. Okay, I'm in agreement. Uh, you know, it seems like we'd be in a position to vote if we could sort of get some some wordage together here that this sort of backs up what we're about to vote for. So something Joe and everyone were, were saying that um, grade, right? They were they were within that. And then that you're saying within that 25 feet to the curb, um, you know, the, the figure to consider is the average grade and that falls within the limits established by the zoning. So is there anything else somebody could add to that? Like, it sort of backs up why we're feeling the way we are. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. And I'll take notes to what you all say and we'll have that draft um, as long as, you know, you're, you've outlined that your rationale for the decision and um, before you vote, we can then um, write your comments up and bring it back to you for your final review before um, yeah. formally filing the decision. Um, yeah, I think if I'm assessing this correctly, board members feel that one, the zoning was applied correctly and that the zoning ordinance allows for flexibility um, as it pertains to that 8% grade change. And in that sense, the project team adhered to the zoning. Does that seem correct? I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's pretty close, but I, I think it's, I don't want to say that it allows for flexibility, but it is, it doesn't necessarily cover this situation where there's, you know, potentially small segments within it that don't even cross the entirety of, you know, the access way. Um, and so it's not addressed in that sense is more what's coloring my decision. And then based on that, though, you, you feel that the zoning ordinance was applied correctly? Yeah. Okay. I'm comfortable voting. Does anybody else have anything that they wish to say or bring up? I'm comfortable voting. Okay. Mike, would you like to make a motion? 
<laughs> Again, um, you just have to make a, vo a motion to, to, for us to vote. It gets seconded and then Again, we'll be um, summarizing. Smith. <laughs> sure. Um, my motion is that the, the zoning administrator um, calculated the um, um, slope of the driveway in an appropriate way. And his conclusion that it did not exceed a maximum grade of 8% um, was derived from that appropriate calculation. Is there someone to second that? I'll second it. Okay. Um, so again, did the zoning administrator correctly apply the zoning ordinance to the calculation of driveway grade? Um, and it's either yes or no. So, so um, actually when this gets wordsmithed, it might be useful as far as I'm concerned to include some language about the 25 foot distance over which it was calculated. Um, but I can't think on my feet fast enough tonight to um, get that proposal out. Okay. Uh, Megan, would you please poll the board members? Mr. Cannon. Yes. Um, Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Kirby. Yeah. Mr. Barkin. Yes. Okay, so the motion um, put forth by Mr. Cannon that the, motors, the, mo the zoning administrator did correctly apply the zoning ordinance to the calculation of driveway grade um, carries four to zero. Okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, we'll just keep going. Um, we're right now into front yard parking, right? So the appellants. We're asserting that the proposed front yard parking and driveway areas exceeded the 25% permitted by the zoning ordinance. And we're tasked with determining whether or not uh, the city under Gino uh, made the correct determination at that time. So any questions or comments as we deliberate this one? This one, um, I did not understand the appeal originally. Um, I did um, noodle through it though. And um, I can see what the, uh, the appellant's interpretation is, but um, again, it, it, this looks like a study in fractals to me. Um, I have to agree with Gino's decision on the front yard calculation. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, I would um, share that sentiment. Um, I don't think that Gino miscalculated it based on the the verbiage of the of the city code. Um, whether or not the it needs to be changed to allow for those variations in front yard um, could be up for discussion, um, but based on, on the verbiage, I think that it was calculated correctly. Joe? There was agreement on the 22 foot measurement between both parties, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. But, yeah, cause that was, that kind of influenced where I was at. Cause I, I, I kind of view this one similarly to um, the rear yard. And so maybe if I'm wrong, somebody wants to tell me that. Um, but the, you know, having an issue where we have a front yacht lot line, that's not one straight line, like it gets a little wonky there. Um, and so that's kind of coloring the two the disagreement here to me. Um, but I think ultimately based on the way the law reads and then Gino's calculation of it from there, it fits well within, um, what was prescribed by the law. And so I think he gets that correct, um, based on that. Like, I think we're in a bit of a gray area again with some um, interpretation of how it's supposed to be done. Um, there's room for it. And I think that was, I think both parties utilized that. And, but I do think um, that Gino's calculation and use of those factors was correct. Okay. Yeah, the, the numbers I referenced there, um, Right, were the submitted plans that proposed the 3,000 
212 square feet. Um, and that was of the parking and driveway area. And, uh, you know, based on that, Gino, the zoning administrator calculated it to be 23.7 of the front yard. So by that metric, um, I, I agreed that the zoning ordinance was applied correctly. But does anybody else have comments or thoughts on that? Or, you know, it was a pretty complex presentation, right? So any, any metrics to, to reference directly that we can then point back to later or beyond what, what you've already said, which, which all makes sense. I think for me, I'm focusing on the straight line that was used as opposed to where it kind of changes a bit and that it was acceptable on my reading of, of the law for Gino to use the straight line. So Joe, just to clarify that point, um, are you saying that you're kind of, the, what you feel that the approach taken by the zoning administrator to kind of calculate it as a straight rectangle across the front of the lot is the appropriate calculation? Given the way the law reads, I think it, I think it has, it allows for that. And so in this instance, I think that's correct. Could other board members stand behind that statement? And agree with that? Yes, I'll, I'll agree with them. I can as well. Stephen? Yeah. Okay. Um, is anybody comfortable making a motion? Or Megan, anything else we should discuss on this one? We'll bring up? I think I have the, the point that you, the agreement on the 22 feet, the use of the um, <clears throat> paving number that was submitted by the project team's architect and also the um, approach of using the straight yard um, calculation across the front of the lot um, with the um, least distances being one end of the rectangle that was used for the calculation. So um, okay. if there's anything else, let me know. And again, we can add that. Sure. Um, I can make a motion or somebody else can. It's, it's really up to you guys. I'm nominating you, David. OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question at hand is, did the zoning administrator correctly apply the zoning ordinance to the calculation of front yard parking? I make a motion uh, that says yes. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Megan, would you please pull the members? Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. Mr. Barkin? Yes. That um, motion passes that the zoning administrator correctly applied the zoning ordinance to the calculation of front yard parking. Uh, so next up was the landscape compliance method. Initial thoughts, concerns. Again, the question at hand is whether or not Gino, the zoning administrator, correctly applied the, the zoning ordinance to the determination of compliance with the landscape compliance method. And then if so, why, if not, why? And um, well, I mean, for the landscape compliance method, um, it's at the discretion of the planning and development board um, on whether certain factors are met. And I don't see any error in the way that Gino accepted the planning and development board's decision on that. Uh, matter. I would agree with Stephen. Okay. Yeah, I thought that one was pretty straightforward. They, they went and looked at it. They applied it the way they saw fit. And I think I agreed with their decision in the first place anyway. And then Gino was applying the decision they made. Okay. I agree with that. Um, there is a record 
of the planning board's decision. Um, and that was on September 24th, 2019. So if I'm surmising correctly, board members uh, agree that that determination at the time was sufficient and its influence on the zoning administration, uh, zoning administrator's decision was, was uh, accurate or justified and correct. Um, anything else that, that backs up your decision to you know, vote the way you think you're going to vote? I, I do just want to throw in there that I think there's the interpretation of, uh, oh, let me see if I can find it, but it's whether 325.20 as referenced in the law applies to just the sentence or preceding it or the entire 325.20 section. I do, for what it's worth, think that that would apply to the entirety of 325.20 and not just, I think, 325.20F. Um, I could have that letter wrong, but I think that makes sense. I don't think it'll be applicable at this point, but that was an issue that was out there. Um, so I did want to just address that. Just to clarify, Joe, your thought I, on this is that had the board found that there was a error in the application of ordinance to driveway grade <clears throat> and front yard or front yard parking, I should say, that it would have affected this. But since the board did not um, that's not the case. Like it doesn't affect this, but it's something to know for going forward, I guess I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, some other notable, you know, moments, um, you know, there were drawings submitted to the, the detail, the landscape plans. Um, there's a memo from August 6th of 2019, and that's from the deputy director of planning. And that referenced and referred to the landscape compliance method. Um, so these are some of the, the things within the timeline that we can reference that justify our vote one way or another. Although it does seem like uh, we're leading toward a, uh, a yes vote here. Um, There's an additional drawing done by Stream Collaborative mm -hmm. labeled landscape compliance plan. Uh, does anybody have anything else to add or are you comfortable making a motion? I can make a motion for that. Okay. Um, so uh, whether or not uh, the zoning administrator applied the zoning ordinance in regards with the landscape compliance method. I think that based on the code um, and the um, thought that the planning and development board put into um, whether or not to allow the landscape compliance method um, to proceed um, demonstrates that um, the zoning was properly applied to this. Um, and there's supporting documents for the whole process. So I'd make a motion to vote yes. Right. I can second that. Megan, would you please call um, board members? Yes. Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. Henderson? Yes. Mr. Kirby? Yes. And Mr. Barkin? Yes. Um, and before we go any further, I apologize. I was busy writing and I did not see here who seconded the motion on front yard parking. Um, so if someone else didn't make a moat, no, on that, I would like to go back and re. I think it was Steven. Steven. Yeah, if it was the last one, it was me. Okay. Yeah. Right. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. All right. So, are we ready for number four, which would be the fall zone and setback requirements for tier three personal wireless service facilities? Um, all right. Again, this project. Uh, sites a parking area within the fall zone for the existing cell tower and the appellants asserted that the parking area is in an area where people congregate um, and within the meaning of the zoning ordinance uh, you, you're not allowed to 
have a congregation zone within a, uh, a fall zone. So again, the question is, did the zoning administrator correctly apply the zoning ordinance to the determination that a parking area is not an area of congregation? Uh, thoughts, ideas, suggestions? I can start with this one. Um, I think it's correct. I don't, at least per, like they, they ran through how to define it. They, you know, they provided us with the straight up dictionary definition of an area of congregation, what congregate means. I don't find a parking lot while people may be in it uh, to be a area of congregation. Um, and then in further support, we were provided all those documents relating to um, you know, what would potentially happen if the structure were to come down, um, which I believe is the point of that fall zone. Um, and you know, it talked about the actual uh, field of damage that would be affected as well as that it was, I believe, designed to fall within on itself rather than, you know, out creating a bigger debris field. Um, so all those things given, I do think it was applied appropriately. Okay. Mike, thoughts? Um, I would, I would agree. Um, there was a lot of eyeballs on this one ahead of time when they determined that the, um, the fall distance definition was um, cut in half to the length of the, to the height of the thing. So, um, you know, it's, uh, this wasn't a, a one man act in any way. I mean, this, this was well known. So I would agree. It's not a congregation area. Thank you. Steven, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I don't have anything to add um, to that, but I, I agree with what's been said. Okay. I think for me, the big one is, um, well, the ordinance right at the legislative level prohibits certain uses. It doesn't necessarily prohibit other uses. So though it might seem vague, that's a legislative issue. Um, and as it pertains to this specific matter, I would agree that the zoning ordinance was applied correctly because there's that leniency within the code. Um, this one I think is more straightforward than some of the other ones. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable voting on it if somebody wants to, to make a motion. Oh, I'll move to vote on whether the zoning administrator Zoning administrator correctly applied the zoning ordinance to the determination that a parking area is not an area of congregation. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. So in the manner that the, it, what the zoning administrator correctly applied the ordinance, um, Mr. Kirby's motion was yes and Mr. Cannon Second to the yes. Yes, and your vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. It's okay. Uh, Mr. Henderson. Yes. Mr. Kirby. Yep. And Mr. Barkin. Yes. And that takes us to number five, which was rear yard. And that was uh, the appellants asserted that the average lot depth was calculated incorrectly. Um, the assertion there is that the project is deficient in the required rear, rear yard. Uh, and then, of course, the, the question there is, did the zoning administrator correctly apply the zoning ordinance to the calculation of rear yard? Um, and the vote here is either yay or nay. Thoughts, um, opinions, and supporting facts. Stephen? Maybe a start or? Um, I, I do think that the average rear lot, lot line um, should have been calculated at the um, end points of the front lot line. Um, so to vote no, that this, the Gino measured it um, correctly Okay. Um, in that measure. And can you just go back to the reasoning just so we can follow? Uh, 
So he he measured it from the largest depth of the property, um, uh, and it, I think that the measurement should have been taken from the um, end point, both end points of the front plot line, um, which do result in that uh, variation um, because of the curvature of the line. Okay. Mike or Joe, thoughts on that? I thought this one was similar to um, the parking situation. Again, we've got an issue created by the lack of a straight line um, created on that front lot line. So I, I can see where Gino again took what was effectively the flat portion to figure out that depth. Um, and then the appellant's argument that no, you should have used the front line that alters then that measurement. Um, but it's kind of similar, like it's it's a similar question to the one I had about the parking, um, where you know, does the law allow for that or or allow for Gino to kind of interpret it that way? Um, you know, saying that this is what the flat line is, or does it does it account for situations in which this line isn't straight? Um, and kind of averages can be used. And I think um, I'm not remembering exactly where it was, but that. I think the law itself for calculating the other portions of it want you to take the average uh, numbers to get that figure figured out. Um, so I think I was looking closer to how I found on the parking issue where it does it doesn't specify to agree that it to a degree that it isn't allowed and it does allow for um, I think this time it allowed for a little more flexibility in its use of averages to find these lot depths okay mike what are your thoughts on that i would agree with what joe just said um this one had me a little flummoxed i did a i did my own subdivision years ago and came across uh, not a straight back line and um again I, it was a straight line it was just on an angle it was much easier decision but uh, on this one i think uh, Gino worked with what he had and um, made a reasonable uh, decision. For what it is worth in instances of ambiguity, um, as I understand it, and Joe, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this as, as an attorney, but uh, in New York State, you know, zoning ambiguities uh, usually tend to veer toward the, the rights of the property owner. Um, which is something that I would reference in support of this. But what are your thoughts on that? Like it, it does, but like it can certainly be overcome for more or less whatever reason you see fit. If you think it, you know, as simple as it just doesn't result in a um, just outcome, I would say, you know, obviously this isn't my area of expertise or anything like that. Like don't, I'm not operating in my legal capacity here, but um, no, I mean, the, I do believe it's correct that the presumption points towards the uh, presumption is not the right word, but it does point towards the land owner. Um, but I don't think that's dispositive by any stretch of the imagination. I don't I don't think we want to include that in our decision. No. Their attorney jumped up and down when we when yeah. that came out in our previous meeting. Um, that may or may not be true. Um I'll leave that up to a judge, but uh, in my case, I don't, I don't want to buy into that statement. Okay. So then if you were to vote one way or the other, you'd be, you, you wouldn't want that referenced. Um, I'd prefer it not be referenced okay. that we, that we not make our decision reliant on that. Perfect. Okay. Um, I guess Can I just summarize real quick, David, what I heard. So yeah. I know I heard from Stephen that he thought believe the um the two segments should be measured both from where the side yards met the front property line. Um so that they were measured from that same type of location. Um no, I believe I heard from Joe and Mike that they believe that it's not as clear within the ordinance and it allows um the zoning administrator to make the that interpretation to get the the average depth and um it's not specified is that does that summarize 
kind of what you what everyone has said i think that's about the gist of it for me okay. yeah that sounds right anything else or Uh, people are comfortable voting on this one way or the other. Is there a motion? Dave, why don't you make the motion on this one? Okay. All right. Um, the question at hand is rear yard and whether or not the zoning administrator correctly applied the zoning, zoning ordinance to calculate rear yard. Uh, I do make a message, uh, a motion that yes, the zoning administrator did do so. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second it. Okay. Ms. Wilson, will you please poll members? Mr. Cannon? Yes. Mr. Henderson? No. Mr. Kirby? Yes. Mr. Barkin? Yes. Okay, so that motion carries three to one um, that the zoning administrator did apply the zoning um, ordinance correctly. Um, so I believe that is vote on all five of the points that are being considered um, and uh, unanimous agreement on the first four that the ordinance was applied correctly and still approval that it was applied, applied correctly for the fifth, which was rear yard. Um, I have a lot of notes um, and we will go ahead and write up the decision, the formal decision based on the comments that the board members have made. Um, and at the board's meetings next week, you've already voted, but you'll um, essentially confirm that the um, decision, the written decision is consistent with your discussion this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, if that matters finished, then um, I believe what happens next, Megan, when we move on to the next appeal, or is there anything else for this one? Yes, so that is all for this appeal for this evening. Our next appeal is um, coming, sorry, I have to pull up the next file, um, is for the Catherine Commons project that the board heard um, a preliminary presentation of at the January meeting, and they are here this evening to begin um, formal consideration of their appeal. So, um, and with that, I'll be signing out and turning this over to Marshall. Um, and then, uh, I'll jump back on after I'll be watching on YouTube. Well, oh, uh, yeah, I'll just, Megan, I'll wait for a text from you and I'll. Okay. I'll yep. That's fine. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So there's Marshall. Hi, Marshall. Howdy. Thank you How's for joining it going? us. Yeah, of course. Um, so it looks like Annie has everybody in the room here. I think I've got everybody. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, uh, just let the team know to let, to state if they're missing anybody. And identify them by name, please. Um, I will go ahead. I guess Marshall was okay and read the opening, and then we can see if we have everybody in the room. Um, Great. So appeal number 3209 for Catherine Commons, appeal of Trowbridge Wolf Michaels on behalf of um, Kyle Ed, whoops, I, sorry, I see a typo in here, um, for an area variance from section 325452E, College Town Residential, three <laughs> district standards for off street parking in rear yard, section 325452F, College Town Residential, four district standards for rear yard, and, college, and section 325452G, mixed use district standards for building height and feet, building height and stories, and required corner chamfer or setback in the NU2 district um, requirements, the zoning ordinance. The applicant proposes to consolidate the parcels at 118 Cook Street, 202 College Avenue, 204 College Avenue, 206 College Avenue, and 210 College Avenue into a single parcel with primary frontage on College Avenue, forming the Catherine South project site. The applicant also proposes to consolidate 120 Catherine Street, 122 Catherine Street, 124 Catherine Street, 128 Catherine Street, 
302 College Avenue, 304 College Avenue, and 306 College Avenue into a single parcel with primary frontage on College Avenue, forming the Catherine North project site. All existing structures will be demolished, and the applicant proposes to construct six new buildings along Cook Street, Catherine Street, and College Ave, including one, one three-story multiple dwelling in the CR3 district, two, two four-story multiple dwellings in the CR4 district, and three, two seven-story multiple dwellings in the MU1 district, and one eight-story mixed-use building in the MU2 district. The project will require several variances to be constructed as proposed. Um, I, since I believe the board has seen this, I'm just going to read off the, the headings and then there's the information there further. So Catherine South for CR3 will require off-street parking, rear yard, and required vegetative buffer. And MU1, which is buildings 3A and B, 3A and 3B will be building height. Catherine North for CR4, which is buildings 2A and 2B will be rear yard. And the MU2 portion, which is building one, will be building height and citing exceptions for corner lots in the MU2 district. Um, as I mentioned, the team gave an initial presentation of this project at our meeting on January 4th, and they've now submitted a formal application for the required area variances, and the board is going to begin consideration of the appeal right now. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm, I'm fresh at these, so <laughs> forgive me if I miss any steps along the way. Um, I think, so it sounds like tonight, will it, it, uh, is it my understanding that tonight is our public hearing for Catherine Commons? Yes, yeah, so this evening, um, the project team is gonna give um, about a 10 minute presentation on, um, last month they focused on an overview of the project and tonight they wanna yeah. focus on not to steal their thunder, but the appeal the requests themselves um, and then right. we will have the public hearing it has been advertised but we won't close the public hearing tonight we're going to keep it open until the march meeting after the planning board um, completes environmental review and also um, issues a recommendation on the request of variances great that's helpful and we did receive um, i guess when we open that we can read into the record some of the things that we've received um, thanks. Um, so first, I want to make sure we have everybody from the Catherine Commons team here. Um, I saw a couple of people logging on. Um, Arvind, I think you're sharing. Are you going to kick us off? I will. Uh, Catherine is going to start off. I'm the driver. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine. Um, I go ahead and present. Uh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Catherine Wolf of Trowbridge Wolf Michaels, Landscape Architects, and I'd like to give a, a brief presentation on how the variance request relates to the five considerations that you'll be uh, reviewing. Um, next slide, Arvind. Um, I think you are familiar with the specific variances. Um, Megan just summarized them. Uh, so I'm not going to go through these. Uh, this is here for reference uh, if, if we need to take a look at it later. Uh, next slide. Uh, we are requesting an area variance, and this is just a reminder that the area variance is a balancing test. Does the benefit to be realized by the applicant in this application outweigh any identified detriments to the health, safety, and welfare of the community if the variance is granted? This is the overriding consideration. Next slide. In making the determination of the balancing test, the board will also consider uh, the following five uh, criteria. And I'd like to touch on each one of these individually and how they relate to our project. Next slide. Consideration one, there will be no undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood or detriment to nearby properties by the granting of the variance. The College Town neighborhood is defined by numerous other student housing apartment and commercial mixed use developments. This project is consistent with this existing development mix, as well as the intended development of College Town as documented in numerous plans. The project is consistent with existing zoning districts. The floor and height variance request is located within the mixed use one and two districts. And I'm quoting now from zoning code related to these districts. The purpose of the mixed use districts is to create a dynamic urban environment in which uses reinforce each other and promote an attractive walkable neighborhood. 
The mixed use districts allow the highest density within the college town area form districts. Redevelopment is anticipated and encouraged. And the intent is to concentrate the majority of additional development within these districts, close quote. The project is also compatible with nearby historic resources. Uh, we presented the project to the IALPC on January 18th, and the board expressed strong positive support for the project, acknowledging high quality materials and design, and they really appreciated the overall integrated approach that provides benefits to the neighborhood above and beyond what is required by code. The project complies with and advances the goals of the City of Ithaca's operative planning documents, including the 2009 Urban Plan and Conceptual Design Guidelines, the 2015 Comp Plan, and the 2017 College Town Design Guidelines. Next slide, please. Consideration number two, uh, the benefits sought cannot be achieved by another method that is feasible to the applicant. The Catherine Commons project aspires to be transformational for College Town, consistent with the College Town and other city plans. Implementing the vision and transforming the public realm cannot happen with the construction of a single building. To transform the public realm and create the public benefits requires the assembling of multiple parcels and the development of an overall urban plan, such as uh, what is being proposed for the Catherine Commons. We investigated an as of right scenario. This is illustrated in the plan at the bottom of the page. Here you can see the building footprint positioned along College Avenue as of right, yielding a 12 foot sidewalk along Catherine North and uh, on Catherine South ranging from 11 feet to 18 feet. The diagram on top illustrates uh, the generous sidewalk widths and plaza spaces of the proposed plan. Uh, at the intersections uh, at Catherine South, for example, you can see 40 foot by 40 foot plaza space at the street level. Uh, and at Cook Street, a uh, 77 foot plaza space by 41. Uh, it was determined that the as of right scenario does not meet the objectives of the project to yield these public benefits and the vision uh, of the College Town Plan. Next slide. Consideration three. The requested area variances are not substantial. When considered in the context of the existing site conditions, the benefits to the College Town neighborhood and the public realm, the variances sought are insubstantial. It has been well settled that the substantiality of a variance is not solely a mathematical formula. Rather, the magnitude or substantiality of the variance is only relevant in relation to any actual impacts of the variance on the neighborhood or nearby properties. This is the balancing test. There are no perceptible or identifiable negative impacts associated with the requested variances, as the granting of the variances will permit the development of a project that first furthers the redevelopment of College Town in conformance with the city's foundational planning documents mentioned previously. Next slide. Uh, consideration number four, there will be no adverse effects or impacts on the physical or environmental conditions of the neighborhood or district. We've already established that the project is consistent with the mixed use character and intended redevelopment of College Town as documented in numerous planning studies. The ILPC has responded favorably to the project. Stormwater management will actually improve as a result of the project. Impervious area is actually reduced and green space slightly increased. Landscaping, pedestrian amenities and streetscape enhancements will benefit neighboring properties the larger college town neighborhood and the overall public. Next slide. <clears throat> a comment made at the last planning board meeting was that they really appreciated that we were also creating green space behind the buildings for tenants and planting large trees on the property. As these large trees will benefit the neighborhood in a neighborhood where many trees are being cut down but not being planted uh, in other development projects. 
Uh, and finally, the project will not result in any negative impacts to traffic, but will provide enhancements for public transportation and walkability. Next slide. Consideration number five. While the difficulty is self-created, it is a function of existing site conditions and the goal of realizing the college town vision and urban plan. By aggregating multiple properties and creating an integrated overall urban vision, the Catherine Commons project provides a unique opportunity to be transformational for college town, consistent with the city's planning documents. However, the challenges of the existing site conditions such as severely steep, severely steep topography and narrow sidewalks and the limited right of way become compounded when dealing with the overall larger site. The dramatic grade change across the site makes, makes it extremely challenging to, make, to meet grade plane averages required to meet zoning heights. The only way to achieve the benefits of the public plazas is by sacrificing building square footage on private property. This comprehensive and integrated approach to achieving the greatest benefits to the public realm results in the current project design before you. Next slide. In conclusion, when considering the area variance balancing test, it is not a numbers game on each of the considerations such as substantiality or self-creation. Rather, the charge is to consider the totality of the project overall. No negative impacts to the area have been identified and only undeniable benefits. This project was first presented to the planning board for sketch plan review in April of 2021. The project has been before the public for 10 months now. And within that time, the city has received numerous letters in support of the project, including a letter of support from the former director of planning, Tace Van Court. Both the planning board and the ILPC support the project. Uh, and this concludes our presentation and we would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question, I suppose, um, Arvind, it seems like you were driving, but also for Megan. Um, it would be helpful, I think, because uh, we'll be considering uh, what is on the record in our deliberations um, next month, um, to have a copy, both the slides that we saw last month, as well as tonight. Is that something that you'd be willing to share with us? Absolutely, no problem. Thank you. Um, I think we'll open it up, uh, not for the public hearing yet, but for questions and comments from the board, uh, if I have that right. I have one um, mentioned support from the planning board, which is great, and it you know it's helpful to have projects on a on a long time frame, <laughs> having having seen it in the public realm for a while. So that's definitely helpful. Um, I do think that we'll, we'll sort of hold until we get their official language um, for our next meeting. Um, but I have I have read some of the the notes and the deliberations when they have seen Catherine Commons. I mean, the other one I wanted to question or to ask about was the ILPC comments. I don't know that I have seen, um, and maybe I just haven't looked far enough. Um, but I wanted to make sure we had those as well. We have not received any formal comments from the ILPC yet. I will get them prior to your next meeting and distribute. Great, thanks. So, you know, I can just share um, that Brian McCracken uh, told me that um, they don't actually provide their, because none of the variances are actually, actually apply to any designated properties. They don't actually provide their comments to the BZA unless it's requested. And so, I'll be requested but, it, Catherine. But, yeah. I'll get it from him, so. Sure. Cool. Uh, Mike, Joe, Steven, yeah. anybody? I had a question about the parking. I know you guys um, are setting up to, uh, I think, use a different, uh, spaces, parking, garage, correct me if I'm wrong about that. I just want to know how close it was. Um, so are you familiar with the College Town Terrace pro property? I can't say I'm particularly. Okay, so it's located, um, if you travel uh, down College Avenue uh, to State Street, it's, it's right there. 
Oh God. Well, you go, you, you, don't, you go down yeah. College Avenue to Mitchell and then take a right on Mitchell and then it's, it's, it's that's right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, that's about, it's, it's a block and a half uh, from the project. Okay. So and there is a private shuttle that? that is also operated from the College Town Terrace uh, to Cornell and uh, it stops on College Avenue and will be available for these tenants as well. Um, Joe, do you still have the hard copy book um, from- Yeah, I was trying to go back through it. No, it's okay. There's, um, I, I just wanted to share there, um, the project team in there included a, a nice map of the location and the relationship between the location, the two projects, as well as the um, shuttle stops that um, Catherine just mentioned, so. Right. I have a question um, about the uh, variance for the required vegetative buffer on building four. Um, could you just give me a rundown of what you're looking at for that? Or explain why that buffer won't be there. about the requirement? Um, from the project team. Um, the project, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. So you want to go to the site planner again? Yep. Um, let's uh, let's see. So that's on the uh, that's on the Cook Street property. Um, um, looks like looks like it's on Catherine South Building Four. Um, that's that's Cook Street right. Building Four. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So. The, um, so the Western boundary on Cook Street, um, because it, in, in its current configuration, that lot, that's the Western boundary is a side yard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when, once you consolidate all the parcels, that the Western boundary becomes the rear yard. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it has this larger setback um, but in fact, you don't really want, you, you really prefer it to function as a side yard so that the, um, so it feels consistent with um, the, the pattern of development along the street today. And so therefore that's why the variance in that location. And, and so the, um, that vegetative buffer is actually, would actually be located within that setback that no longer exists because of the location of the building. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think that might be all from the board. I don't have anything else. Final call for comments before we um, open the public hearing uh, for which we will, I believe Megan, if I'm not mistaken, will read into the record um, information that we've received thus far, uh, see if there's any public out there waiting to speak and then hit pause for a month. <laughs> Uh, actually, we are going to start talking through the um, the variance requests um, that to give the team some feedback um, going forward. And also, I ideally, if um, the board seems to be in agreement, and they, it might be to the point then that based on your comments tonight, I can draft a decision that the board can then vote on at the March Great. 1st meeting. Um, okay. So if, in terms of the public hearing... Well, Marshall, I can let you open it, but um, the, let me pull those up for you. Um, do we, we need a motion for the public hearing? I uh, know you just have to declare it open, so. Great. So I am hereby opening our public hearing for uh, Catherine Commons on February the 1st, 2022. Um, so we did receive two comments. They have been distributed to the board. So um, there was a letter in support of the proposal from Taste Van Court at 102 Irving Place. 
Um, and then there was also a petition of some college town property owners that listed various properties um, for the project in general. Um, and as I mentioned, I did not go through the petition to confirm ownership or addresses or anything because I wanted to get it out to the board. Um, these do not have to be read since the board has them and they are included on file as in support of this request. Great. Um, I do not have anyone signed up to speak this evening in support of the um, in support of the requests. Um, and just to streamline the process, I have not received any comments in opposition or nor do I have anyone signed up to speak in opposition to the requests. Great, thank you. Uh, so we'll leave the public hearing open uh, for the planning board as well as for other comments that may come in in the, in the next month or so. Um, but I'd love to hear from my fellow board members on their thoughts. Um, I think the, the requests on this variance are modest when you consider everything that's going into it. Um, I find it an attractive project. Uh, I like the enhanced sidewalk. Um, I would prefer if up on Dryden Road, they had some activity going on in the uh, Bresciano Center. It, it just looks like an empty floor that you share with us. But um, other than that, hopefully we'll see a little more activity in these. Um, but I think that is a, a good example of the quality of design and construction we've been seeing um, from this group. Yeah, I agree. Um, for the for the sheer size and magnitude, um, you know, some of them, you know, you look at the like raw numbers, and it's you know a seventy five percent deficiency for the yard stuff, but it's not really that. I think when we're looking at it, um, and then you know, you, it, I think we pointed out, or I think they pointed out last time about the heights, and there's an allowed parapet, so it's not as tall when viewing it. I thought that was helpful to know. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I think it's a good project. Um, I can't see a ton of sticking points for myself unless something comes up. I think I'd agree so far. Um, I think especially when you consider the scale of the project, um, while on a on one sheet of paper, it's a lot of variances. <laughs> um, you could imagine this being broken up into four or five different projects. Um, and you could easily consider seeing those same number of variances from just this amount of construction and such a unique topography and, and sort of use case for what we want uh, college town to look like and what, how the zoning is written. Um, I'm either it's a really great project or we haven't, or the public doesn't know enough about it. <laughs> um, and I say that because I, I, it seems to me that we, sh we would typically expect um, some negative feedback on a project of this size um, anywhere in Ithaca. <laughs> um, and so not seeing that negative feedback and and so far only limited, we, it's, it's, it's positive feedback. It does seem somewhat limited. It's not you know, hordes of people pounding on our doors, but we don't usually get that for positive feedback. Um, so I was excited. I was looking forward to the, to the public hearing, thinking that there'd be a, um, more activity and there being none, I think is a good sign. I did want to ask about the rear yards for 2A and 2B. Is that a similar issue to what Steven asked about where because of the consolidation, it's, it's kind of making a rear yard look like a side yard? That's, that's exactly the situation. Yep, okay. Can I jump in, Marshall? Yeah, please. So what I'm hearing from the board is at this point, um, support for the, the requested variances. Um, I have not heard 
um, concerns about, I don't think any, I haven't heard any concerns voiced about the variances that are being requested. Um, so if it is helpful to the board for the March 1st meeting, I can um, draft the decision to kind of reflect that, but also reference the criteria um, for the board to review on the floor and then hopefully vote that day um, and move, move forward from there, um, if that's agreeable to the members. That's fine, that makes sense. Pending anything from the environmental review or other public mm -hmm. comments, of course, you would modify um, to reflect your thoughts at that time. Helpful. Um, is this, do you expect Megan there to be a change? I know there's been some change of dates for March meetings. Do you expect, or for February, do you expect there to be a slew of additional meetings? Um, I believe that this one is, I have scheduled right now for, um, for March um, 1st um, for a vote, unless something should change with either a uh, project change or environmental review at the planning board. Um, but it, at this point, it sounds like the board is comfortable moving ahead um, on the first. Okay. And uh, I, I guess I would just confirm that the, the, yeah, the planning board, I think, is scheduled to, uh, they are planning to give um, uh, proceed with the uh, environmental declaration at their February meeting and a recommendation. They discussed that at the last meeting. Um, yeah, that's great. So I think we should be on schedule then for the um, March 1st meeting. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're winding down. Anybody else have comments or thoughts before we sign off on this one? Not sign off, but sign off for tonight. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you for everybody's participation. Did you have something? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank have you. a good night. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Um, and so we'll leave public hearing open and we'll get back together on the first. Thanks so much. Good night. I'll work with Catherine and get the slides um, that they've shared the past two um, meetings out to everybody so that you have those um, as you consider your um, your decision. Um, and Joe, I I just because I, I remembered that this map just because I found it helpful myself is in the hard copy on page seventy eight. Um, there's a, a really nice map that helps kind of show different transportation options in the proximity of the project. Not not at all putting it on the spot, but I just thought that was a great map and wanted to make sure draw attention to it. So. Yeah, no, I had, I knew I had seen it and I, I just know, couldn't. We've had a lot of paper lately. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> um, all right, well, thank you for that. Let me pull up our next agenda item. I think it's mostly just administrative and housekeeping kind of things. <clears throat> um, I think, let's see. Um, okay, so we are gonna have another opportunity to all get together and work together next Tuesday at six o'clock <laughs> where we're gonna tackle another um, collection of appeals. Um, I will say I did not expect this meeting to go as quickly as it did. So um, the, that's why we originally split it into two, but um, I'm surprised tonight. Um, so that is what the, um, we'll do next week and we, next week, um, you'll be getting that email link from me tomorrow morning, um, that has the packet for the February 8th appeals, um, January 1st right now, or January 1st, March 1st is also, we have about, um, I think six appeals currently scheduled, um, for that meeting as well. So February 8th at 6, February 15th at 6 p.m. is um, the joint training a, with the plan. Oh, sorry. A question on February 8th. Uh, did yeah. you hear back from Stephanie? Do you still need an alternate? She is uncertain whether she is able to attend yet. Um, if it is something you can sign on for, Marshall, I, I'll definitely take the help. Um, we The appeal that we would potentially need help with is um, 
will be second on the agenda. Um, so it should be up um, probably by 6.15. You would be um, ready to consider 6 that. 6.15. Yeah. One agenda and fifty one agenda data in fifteen minutes. It's great. It's a very it's a um yeah, well the first it's an easy I, one. The first appeal I expect to be pretty um straightforward. Um and then six, the second one we would probably start around six fifteen. So um, okay. I can't guarantee that that one will take, which is the one we would need an alternate's participation for. I can't guarantee that'll take fifteen minutes, but um sure. Um yeah, I'll sign up for it. if you hear from Stephanie and she's able okay. to. I'll um I gladly give up my spot and do bedtime okay. with the kids, but All right. um if you need me, I can be here. Great, thank you. Um, okay. I'll plan to join um when you text me, or do you want me just to come at six fifteen? Probably, if you want to come um close to, right around six fifteen, I imagine that okay. be. I don't. I think that's even might be um you might even. You, I might text you again and be like, okay, we're ready. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, 615 would be great to have the help. Okay. So. Um, then the February 15th is the joint training with the planning and development board. Um, it is a little bit about each board, what their um, powers, responsibilities are, what things they have to consider, how the boards can work together, but how they're different. Um, and I'm looking forward to this particular training. Um, and I think I think it'll be helpful to all of us, both our board and the planning board, um, and hopefully kind of um, come up with ways to better work together to avoid some of the situations we've had on some projects recently where they have been with the planning board for a long time and then get maybe not the warmest reception for their requested variances from the BZA. So that, um, that will have uh, six o'clock on Zoom as well on the 15th. So, um, um, I think that is all I have for this evening. Does anyone have any questions or? No? I'm shocked. I, I am completely shocked. I, um, you guys were on it tonight and I didn't, I thought we would be here, um, for a lot longer. So, um, I mean, I could have filled this agenda a little more for you guys. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so we will write up um both the decision for 815 south aurora and kind of get a final sign off on that um, by next week and i will also draft something for the board's consideration for um catherine commons for the march 1st meeting so all right Anything thank else? you see you, you next week yep thank see you, you all everyone. next week bye have a good night yeah